All right, let's do a small recap on reactive behaviors and state machines from the previous model. So far, you should have completed around 45% of part one. And that is this course here on Coursera. That is a third or This is a brief video on the content of module four. We will start with a recap on module three and some administrative things. So far, you should have completed around 45% of part one, that is this course of the specialization. Some of you are already ahead at this point and others haven't really started in submitting the assignments. You are still totally fine, but doing this later will get much harder and content will get more challenging starting today. So if you haven't started yet, I implore you go ahead and do the assignments in depth and get into the habit of regularly chipping ahead away on the content. When we talked about reactive behaviors, I explained to you how very basic behaviors work by tying the actuation directly to sensing. And this is still relevant for today's most successful robots like the Roomba that uses such behaviors to find its charging station and dock. We also talked about formal definition for state machines. And when you do the write-up in the peer review for reactive behaviors, you were asked to draw out a state machine that follows this definition. The idea is to have states that very clearly delineate the behaviors that the robot implements and events which are indicating to the robot that it should switch its state. Some of you have already jumped the gun if you want and provided extended finite state machines. In this case, people added variables to augment the state and thereby get away with lesser states that need to be drawn. This is technically correct, but it's not what is asked. And I think it's important for you to understand what extended finite state machines are. You will usually need them when you cannot enumerate all states on paper. For example, if you want to have a robot that does n U-turns before stopping, you would need to dry, draw as states up to n turns. So the first turn, then you drive, then you hit the next obstacle and so on until you have the nth turn. And here the variable of the number of turns is implicitly encoded in the number of states that you draw. Now, what you can also do is you can introduce a counter which counts the number of states, but you have to understand that updating this counter is a side action that doesn't happen in the state, but happens right when you decide that the state transition happens. In extended finite state machine syntax, this is known as a guard condition, which is the event that you already know, that is followed by an action. And usually you put a slash there, you put the guard condition first, and then you put the action. So for example, in this case, we have no guard condition in the beginning, we directly jump into the drive state, but we do have an action which sets the counter to zero. Also, after every turn, we have an event which we call here has turned, but then we have an action that increments the counter. Now we get away with just three states. When we are driving and there's an obstacle and the counter is n, then we stop. Otherwise, if the counter is smaller than n, we do the U-turn. So again, you can use this, but this is not what has been asked in the first peer review. All right, so today we will talk about coordinate systems, degrees of freedom, and forward kinematics. So first, before we start talking about coordinate systems, we want to introduce the word degrees of freedom. So this is a little confusing because some people think that degrees means like degrees, like three degrees or five degrees. No, degrees means something like the extent of motions that you can do. And here the idea is that you have 
three axes in a coordinate system that something can move along. So it can move forward or back. It can move sideways or to the other side and it can move down or up. In addition, we have rotations around these axes. So an airplane, for example, can pitch, that is putting its nose up and down. It can roll, that is turning to the left or to the right. And it can yaw, which is turning around its center. And so with that, we talk about a six, dimension, six dimensions in the degrees of freedom, the three translations, x, y, and z, and the three rotations. With this, we are getting a 6D pose. We are interested not only in the position of the center of the aircraft, but we will also need to know the angles of pitch, yaw, and roll. These six numbers fully characterize the state of the plane. Unfortunately, it's not as easy when you think about how to describe the pose of this robot here, we can easily provide you with a vector that tells us where the robot is in space. So there are three numbers here, x, y, and z. But you will find quickly that providing three numbers really requires not only providing the numbers, but also the order of rotation. So for example, I could say I have to rotate by 120 degrees around the x-axis. Then I have to rotate by 20 degrees around the z-axis and then I have to rotate around the y-axis. Not only does this require additional information, which is the order, but it also turns out that this doesn't always work. So the only way to really determine the pose, the complete pose of an object in space, is pro by providing an entire coordinate system. With this coordinate system that is rooted at the center of the object, I can fully determine the orientation of the object in space. When we talk about coordinate system, one thing that is important is the right-hand rule, or actually there are two right-hand rules. If you want to remember whether the y-coordinate axis goes this way or that way, take your right hand and align the thumb with your x-axis. And I actually recommend you to do that right now while you're listening to this. You use your pointing finger and point it along the y-axis and then you use the middle finger to align it with the z-axis. And so there's no way of doing this the wrong way. Once you indicate which way y goes, you know where z has to go. In order to understand how the direction of rotation works, take your right hand again and cusp your hand and now orient the thumb with the direction of one of the axes and look at the direction your fingers point. And this is the direction that the positive orientation is going. Uh, there is a video on Coursera where we do all of this in Rewards and you can see these numbers directly and you know, change them and see what happens. I recommend you to watch that. We won't do this here again. Now, we also talk about why we need much less than nine values to express rotations. So you might have seen that in Rebos, it uses axis angle or quaternion notation, which is getting away with four numbers. How this is done is a little much right now but I want to give you some intuition why four numbers are actually enough. So when you think about the pose of a robot as three vectors, that is three basis vectors, like this is the x-axis, this is the y-axis, and that is the z-axis, that determine the coordinate system at the location of the robot, you will find that these three basis vectors are orthonormal. Orthonormal means that they're orthogonal and that they're normal. That means their length is one. So what does that mean? Orthogonal means that once you know two of these vectors, you can compute the third one because it must be orthogonal to the other two. It's like the right hand rule. Once you have put out the X and the Y axis, you will know where the Z axis is. So we can actually drop these three values. If they're not given, you could compute them.
Secondly, the vectors are normal. That means they are length 1. Which that, what that means is if I give you two numbers only, you can compute the third number because you know that the overall length of the vector needs to be 1. So if I tell you that the first vector is 1, 0, you will know that the next entry is 0. And likewise, if I tell you there is a vector of 0, 0, you would know, well, the third entry must be 1. Now, these four numbers are not what axis angle or quaternion notation are, but they provide you with an intuition of why four numbers are actually enough. Now, the word degrees of freedom is confusing on a different level because it is used in two different contexts. The first one is the degrees of freedom of the object in Cartesian space. So Cartesian space is XYZ, it's a 3D coordinate system in which you can have um, a, be a point but also have an orientation which is given by the orientations around the axis. You can see that with the airplane, when you have it in the air, the information of where the center is is not enough. I will need to know the pitch axis, yaw axis, and roll axis rotations. Now, there are some spaces like a plane, like a tabletop, or something like this, where you cannot have all of these degrees of freedom, but you are limited. For example, on a plane that is on a table, you have only three degrees of freedom. You can drive in X and Y. You can't go up and down and you can rotate around the z-axis, but you cannot rotate into the table by rotating around x and y. There's a different context for the word degrees of freedom, which we refer to the degrees of freedom in the actuator space. So the plane might be only fully defined in six degrees of freedom, but it has only three degrees of freedom in actuator space. It is a thruster with which it can drive forward, or fly forward is the better word. And then it has pedals and sticks that allow it to roll around the x-axis and pitch around the y-axis. So these three degrees of freedom are all it can do. So we would say the airplane has three degrees of freedom. In another example, we have the human arm, which has six degrees of freedom in Cartesian space. And here we look at the wrist because that is where the tool is attached. In the human case, it's of course a hand. But this is where we're interested in the degrees of freedom. We don't want to know the degrees of freedom of the shoulder or the elbow. We want to know the degrees of freedom of the tool that we can attach to the wrist. And in this case, the arm can move in 6D or F as other objects. But when we look at the degrees of freedom in actuator space, we will find that it actually has seven degrees of freedom. So it can flex the shoulder or abduct the shoulder. There is a rotation degree of freedom here. You can flex your elbow, you can rotate the forearm, and then you have two degrees of freedom in the wrist. So you can go up and down or left and right. So note you can't rotate the wrist. This happens here in the forearm. And as always, we don't count both directions, but one degree of freedom is given by either directions. So in this case, we count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you can easily verify this. Well, why do you want to do that if you only can reach six degrees of freedom? Well, it adds redundancy. So with that configuration, I have the opportunity to reach a certain pose with more than one orientation. Now, if you have six degrees of freedom, I think you have up to 16 possible um, ways of reaching a certain pose. That is the maximum with seven degrees of freedom. It's even more, if not infinite. Uh, think about the wrist uh, holding still and then move your elbow up and down and you will find that there's an infinite number of poses that you can, um, or infinite number of ways that you can achieve a certain pose. Now when you look at the EPAC or another robot that drives on the ground like the Roomba, it has only three degrees of freedom in Cartesian space. It cannot move up and down, so it only has the X and Y uh, degrees of freedom translation, and it can rotate around the Z axis. 
So total, this gets it to three degrees of freedom in Cartesian space. Now, if you look at the actuator space, you will find that it has only two motors. And with those, it can achieve forward motion and rotation around the Z axis. It cannot move sideways, it can only rotate and move back and forth. So it has two degrees of freedom in actuator space. This also introduces us to the idea of wheels and how they affect the degrees of freedom. The most common wheel is the so-called standard wheel, which can turn and thereby move left and right in this image, but it can also turn or pivot on a point. And you can easily see that in Webots when you set one wheel to zero speed and the other to some speed, then you will see how the robot pivots around a single point which is the contact point of its standard wheel. When you look at an office chair, uh, this is called a caster wheel, which can turn like the standard wheel. It can pivot on the ground, but it can also pivot on the top where it's mounted. So this has three degrees of freedom and it doesn't provide any constraints to the robot. So when you mount a caster wheel, it just provides support for the robot, but doesn't constrain it. When you mount a standard wheel, you know that you cannot move sideways of that standard wheel. So if you mount uh, two standard wheels orthogonally to each other, the robot cannot move forward or backward, and it, can't, uh, it can only rotate around the pivot point of one of the standard wheels. There's another wheel, which is called the so-called Swedish wheel, and you can explore that in Rewards 2. It has rollers that are diagonally mounted and which allow the robot to not only pivot around the center axis, but essentially drive sideways. Finally, there's the spherical wheel, which is like the caster wheel, but those also exist in an actuated fashion. So to memorize here, all wheels can add degrees of freedom or constraints, and when I say add, Think about um, a robot which has only one standard wheel. All it can do is move left and right or back and forth if you want, but it cannot rotate. Now, if you add another wheel in a smart manner, it can also rotate, or you can further constrain the robot motion. So uh, we've seen in the beginning the example of the mechanical wind-up toy that doesn't fall off the table. It is... Um, in standard differential wheel configuration, as we call it, with its two standard wheels. And it has uh, a ball bearing here at the beginning, at the tip, so that doesn't add any constraints. But once the third standard wheel hits the ground, it creates a constraint and effectively takes one degree of freedom away. Here is an example of the KUKA U-Bot, which has for Swedish wheels, and when all of these wheels drive forward, then the robot moves forward. But if these two wheels drive in the opposite direction than the hind wheels, the robot actually drives sideways. The reason for this is because it wants to drive diagonally, but then it cannot, and the two diagonal motions cancel each other out, and it drives to the left. When you have both of these wheels go forward and the other two wheels go backward, the robot turns on the spot. So this robot can reach three degrees of freedom in on the plane and move omnidirectionally. When you look at manipulators, things are a little bit e easier because every motor usually adds a degree of freedom. So to the left here, you see a very simple lever which has one degree of freedom, there's a motor here. Then we add another motor or another link, and this arm can reach two degrees of freedom. And finally, we add the third degree of freedom or the third actuator, and now the robot can reach all 3D, 3D degrees of freedom in the plane, which are a position on the X and Y plane, as well as a rotation around Z. Now we can also add more degrees of freedom here, which doesn't help us to reach more degrees of freedom. We are still limited to three degrees of freedom because we are stuck to the plane, but we get a lot more opportunities to reach them 
in a redundant fashion. And just uh, so you see that here, um, the, the robot here with two degrees of freedom doesn't have any redundancy because even if I would flip this over, the orientation of the claw would change. While here I have the opportunity to flip this over to the other side and keep the claw in this orientation, thereby I can reach this orientation already with two different configurations. Now here are some real world examples. The Kuka U-Bot has four degrees of freedom. You can see this by counting the motors. It can pivot here, then it has a motor here, two, three, and the fourth motor is there. Now the base provides an additional three degrees of freedom. So with this, we have seven degrees of freedom that are actuated. We are now able to reach all the six degree of freedom in Cartesian space with many different configurations. The ABB IRB robot has six degrees of freedom. They're a little difficult to see here. There's a motor one, two, three, and then there are the fourth motor, and then there are two more motors in the wrist. Now we can do this mathematically by actually looking at the location of each of the wheels and starting to derive equations that relate the rotation of the wheel to the motion of the center. There is a separate video on Coursera that you can watch. So I will skip here right to the results. And what we get is six equations, one for each degree of freedom and expressions that relate the speed of the left and the right wheel to the translation in the X direction. You see that two of the equations here are empty and two of the equations for the rotations. And this is actually the mathematical way to see whether you can reach these degrees of freedom or not. If you don't have equations for these, then you just have two degrees of freedom. If we somehow would have found an expression for delta y, then the robot would have three degrees of freedom. Uh, we also note that there's a delta here because these are just incremental motions. So I cannot compute the X and Y and um, Omega uh, relationships by a single equation. What I have to do is I have to add them up. And you see here, as the robot moves forward, eventually it will change its Y position in the world coordinate system. We will do this in the next module. All right, in summary, objects in the world have six degrees of freedom, unless they are constrained in some way, usually on the plane where there are three degrees of freedom. And you really need to geometrically reason about how the different actuators of the robot allow the robot to move and thereby how much, how many degrees of freedom it really has. You will get some experience and be able to just count the motors but then there are certain edge cases where it becomes more difficult. Then you really have to write down the equations and look at how many distinct solutions you get. We have also formally computed the forward kinematics, as it's called, of a typical robotic platform, which is very common in service robotics and industry. What remains to do? I'd like you to go to the quiz, uh, do the reading, then solve the quiz on coordinate systems and degrees of freedom. And maybe you can get started now implementing this forward kinematics in WeBots, which is the next subsection in this module.